Good evening, everybody. Good evening. And welcome to our Lord's House, a special greeting to any visitors who are with us. We're glad you're here as we worship our Lord Jesus. Let's stand and share God's peace with one another.
To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Open your hearts and minds to hear the word of the Lord. 
The first reading is from Genesis 45. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? By his brothers, but his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, Come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you, for you, a remnant on earth, and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father of Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry, and go up to my father, and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, and your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. There I will provide for you, for there are yet five years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. And now your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that it is my mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt, and of all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. After that, his brothers talked with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please read responsibly Psalm 103 as printed. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He forgives all your sins and heals all your infirmities. He redeems your life from the grave and crowns you with mercy and loving kindness. He satisfies you with good things, and your youth is renewed like an eagle's. The Lord executes righteousness and judgment for all who are oppressed. He made his ways known to Moses and his works to the children of Israel. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and of great kindness. He will not always accuse us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins nor reward us according to our wickedness. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so is his mercy great upon those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us. As a father cares for his children, so does the Lord care for those who fear him. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians 15. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us drink, eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning. For some have no, no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, 
perhaps of wheat, or of some other grain. But God gives it to a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand if you are able. I 
say, you know, you know. Well, the other day, you know, uh, I was going in, you know, uh, I was at university and a classmate gave a presentation and it was so annoying, so irritating, I finally started counting 158 you knows <laughs> in a presentation. I just talked to Joyce today. Joyce, do you have a pet peeve? And she said to me, she said, you know what I hate? I go into a parking lot, no one's there, no one's there, and I pull in. And then I come out and somebody wide open, they park right next to me. <laughs> So if you want to irritate my wife, do that, okay? That's her pet peeve. If you want to drive, if you want to drive a hurry, addicted, impatient, type A character, crazy, you know what you want to do? Waste their time. Waste their time. Get in front of them in line like at Starbucks, and you get up to the counter, and they're right behind you, and they're kind of, you know, tapping their toe, you know, waiting for you to get your order in. And then the person behind the counter asks you, what do you want? Say this, hmm, I'm not sure. What do you have? It'll drive them crazy. Do you want to drive a musician? Crazy, Carol. Sing about a quarter of a note flat. Some of you were just doing that. Just kidding. I probably was. Have you ever gone to a, a home of an obsessively neat, perfectionist person? Ever done this? You want to drive them nuts? On a hot day, get a large, sweaty glass of iced tea and put it on an expensive tabletop with fine wood with no coaster underneath it. It'll drive them bonkers. Now, here's why I raised the issue. Do you ever, do you ever wonder what God's pet peeve is? Ever wonder? It's really an important topic. Ever want to know what drives God crazy? What puts God on tilt? And there's a very clear answer to that, and here it is. Mistreat another human being. So, violate community, damage a person, snub somebody, use somebody, freeze somebody out, hold a grudge, spread gossip about somebody, hold back telling the truth to somebody when they need to have the truth told. Pass judgment on them because you don't like them. You don't like their looks. You don't like their dress. You don't like anything about them. Exclude somebody because maybe they're a different color. Keep figuring out ways to spend more on you when little kids are starving to death. Those things put God on tilt. And they drive God nuts and crazy when he sees that. And that's all throughout the Word of God. And so, in the Sermon on the Mount, or in Luke chapter 6, is the Sermon on the Plain. Jesus says, very early on in the text, don't think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. Now remember that phrase, law and the prophets. That's kind of like a little bookend to this whole section, and it's like the first one. Jesus says, don't think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets, and then he goes on to talk about the heart of the law and the prophets, the Torah. And a lot of that is about how you treat people. How do you develop community? And Jesus says, if you don't do that, if you don't do these things, then you face some very serious consequences with God. If you judge people, then what? You'll be judged by God. He says, if you, for, if you refuse to forgive other people their sins, God won't forgive you. He says, if you're filled with contempt for people, and it just kind of leaks out of you, you know, and you begin to say things like, you fool, then you're in danger of the fire of hell. Jesus says, anybody who exploits someone sexually, just objectifying another human being, you may as well start by gouging out your eyes, lopping off your hands, because it's better to lose one part of your body than you have your whole body go to hell. And Jesus says, all of these things are pointing to one direction. God loves people. And God loves all people. And whenever any of us get careless in the way we treat people, it drives God crazy. It puts God on tilt, and it makes God mad. And so Jesus sums up this teaching on the Law and the Prophets in a single sentence. It's probably the most famous sentence in all of human history, and we all know it. What's it called? The golden rule. 
do unto others. That's okay, you can speak out in church. We're Baptist here now, right, God? Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Jesus says, this sums up the law and the prophets. There is that phrase again. The law and the prophets. This is the bookend at the very end of all of this section of this brilliant, amazing teaching of Jesus. And this is why the golden rule is so central to what Jesus said. You know, it's not just a, a cute saying, golden rule. It's not like that. This sums up the whole deal, Jesus, Jesus says. Because our Lord is really concerned uh, because people had turned the law of God and the prophets and the Torah into legalisms. Superficial behavior modification. I crossed this T and I dotted this I, so I'm home free. But I don't really care for people, and I don't really love people. And Jesus says that's the problem. You missed the whole point. So Jesus comes along and says, don't think. I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've come to fulfill them. And then he gives the most brilliant teaching in the history of the human race. How do you deal with your anger? How do you deal with your words? How do you deal with your sexuality? How do you deal with your stuff and money? How do you handle uh, our tendency towards judgmentalism and so on and so on and so on? And then he comes to the end and he says, the whole thing, guys, is summed up like this. You think about how you want somebody to treat you, and then you all go out and you do the exact same thing. This is not just about kind of a, a social interaction. You know, there's an old saying, before you criticize another person, walk a mile in their shoes, and then even if they don't like what you said, you'll be a mile away and you'll have their shoes. <laughs> kind of like that, you know. That's not the golden rule. See, the golden rule is actually about how the kingdom of God works. Now that up there, God has come down here, he's saying, this is a picture of a new life. This is a picture of a new community. This is a picture of a new way of behaving in the world. And this is what it looks like. And this summarizes all of the law and the prophets. Think about what it would be like to be treated a certain way. And you do the same thing as you seek to follow and love God. Think about how you want others to be treated by you, and you go out and be like them. Bill Hybels was pastor of a large, very large church down in Willow Creek, uh, Illinois, and he gave a talk about the Golden Rule, and actually I'm very indebted to many of his thoughts. But he challenged his people in his huge congregation uh, to live for a week with Golden Rule eyes. Live with Golden Rule eyes. And here's the idea. In every interaction, in a coffee shop, with somebody here at church, when you go to work, when you're at school, with people in your family, don't just respond like we, we, we normally do, you know, in kind of a me-centered way. It's all about me. I'm an autopilot, and it's my hopes and my dreams and my fears and my thoughts and my wants. Don't do that. Instead, pause and look at the other person and notice the other person. And begin to ask yourself, I wonder what their story is. I wonder what their dreams are. I wonder what their joys are. I wonder what their fears are. Uh, what would I want if I was in that person's shoes? And then you use imagination and creativity and take initiative. And what, part of what's so wonderful about the Golden Rule is that it's not this legalistic deal that you can kind of, you know, cross it off, check it off, done that. It's this endless spiritual adventure that requires empathy and thought and creativity and I'm putting myself out there in another person's place. And the great thing is this, I can have a golden rule moment every moment that I'm with somebody. I'll give you a classic example. Um, I love golf. I stink at it. But I love the, I love the game. I just love it. Um, so when I go out, I, I, I hope that it's going to be better than the last time I went out. Well, one of my best buddies in Michigan, Dave Champion, is a pretty good golfer. Uh, great guy, great friend. And this time his game was stinking and I was playing out of my head. 
Everything I did was good. It was unbelievable. Uh, I would hit drives, they actually land in the fairway. Uh, I would make putts, and they would actually land in the hole. Uh, I couldn't believe it. I was playing so well that when I got to the 18th hole, I still had several of the same balls I started with. <laughs> and that's huge. Huge for me, okay? So I, I was playing well, and I was keeping score. Mostly, honestly. Um, but I was playing golf the way Jesus would be playing golf if Jesus were playing. It was unbelievable. Uh, and I got to the 18th tee. And I'm eager to hit. And I'm thinking, man, oh man, oh man, best game of my life. I'm killing my buddy. This is a blast. This is so cool. One more hole. One more hole. Be the round of my life. Champ had a tee off first. So he gets the ball and he gets the tee. And he's a real big guy. And He's kind of going slow, and I'm, I got ants in my pants, you know, I just hit that doggone ball. And he's leaning down, and he puts it in, and he gets up there, and he gets up there, he's doing all this stuff, it's like driving me crazy. And all of a sudden, away from his head, he looks up to me, and he starts talking. He starts talking. And it turns out he's got problems. And he had some problems at work, and they were rather serious. And all of this starts coming out at the 18 tee box. And he gets ready to tee off again. And all of a sudden he's saying another thing. I'm going, what in the world? And to be honest with you, I really wasn't listening. I didn't care. Because I'm thinking, man, I'm getting cold. I'm losing my rhythm. I'm not going to do well. I know what's going to happen. I've got to hit the ball. And then this question came to mind. Which is more important, listening to the gut-wrenching concerns of a buddy with a world that maybe was falling apart or hitting a good drive? And I thought, well, that's a hard question to answer. <laughs> and then the golden rule came to mind. And I realized that's not a hard question at all. Because if I was standing in his shoes, I knew exactly what I would want. I would want somebody in my place who actually cared for me, would listen to me, and not focus on little things like hitting a golf ball, but would care and hear and pray. And so I remember saying, all right, God, just help me do it this time. Put that goofy stuff, you know. Put that silly stuff aside. And, and I did that. We talked for probably 10 more minutes in the tee box. And then he hit. And then a funny kind of thing happened. I went up to the tee box, and I took a swing, and, and you know what happened? That ball was shanked so far to right into the woods, I never found it again. <laughs> I'm going to have to ask God about that someday. This happens all the time. Uh, I was traveling one time, I was on a bus at the airport, and I was driven by a bus driver for a car rental company. You've all done those, you know. And it picks people up at the terminal, takes them to the car, uh, and it's a very thankless job, and very, very stressful. But the guy who was driving the shuttle bus was an absolute delight. Uh, he's scanning the curbside, he's looking for anybody who needs a ride, and he would tell those of us who are on the bus, you know, I'm always looking, I'm always looking because sometimes people are running late, and you can tell them their eyes, and I'm always looking for people's eyes, because I never want to miss one. I always want to get, hey, here's another one, and he pulls on over. And as he's doing this, the people on the back of the bus, I wasn't doing that, but the people on the back of the bus were cheering uh, for this guy. He was like the Michael Phelps of shuttle bus drivers. It was like he was going for a gold medal, not a gold medal, but going for the golden rule. And he would grab another people's luggage before they could lift it, and he'd get back on the bus and say, well, we're off. I know you're all eager to get where you are as quick as you can, and I'm going to do my best to get you there. Golden rule moment. There's a writer. His first job was writing for the Buffalo News obituaries. The obituaries. And he got frustrated, he was a young buck, and he really wanted to do a lot of research, do some great writing, he's a you know, Pulitzer Prize. And he worked up enough courage, and he went to his editor, and he asked him, hey, when am I going to get some decent story assignments? And his crusty old editor growled at him, and said, listen, kid, nothing you write will ever get read as carefully as what you are writing right now. You misspell a word, you mess up a date, and a family will notice, a family will be hurt. But you do justice to somebody's grandma, to somebody's mom, and you make a life sing, and they will be grateful forever. In fact, they will put your words in laminate. And the writer said this, I pledge I make extra calls. 
I would ask the extra question, I would go the extra mile. That's a golden rule moment. To write obituaries, they deserve to be laminated. Write obituaries for others as you would want others to write an obituary for you. Because someday, somebody will. And he started the golden rule obituaries. See, the wonderful thing about the golden rule is at any moment, at any moment, any time, any place, any job, any setting, any interaction with another human being, uh, it could be writing, it could be a shuttle bus, all of these can be gold rule moments. You don't need a high IQ, you don't need a lot of money, you don't need a title. In fact, those things usually get in the way because then we start thinking about us instead of other people. And here's the thing about the golden rule. And some of you might know this. Virtually every religion, every tradition has some version of the golden rule. And that is not a bad thing. It is a good thing. Because it means we live in a moral universe. And there are consequences to our actions and our behaviors. And that's a good thing. But what is distinctive about Jesus is this. He didn't give us just a rule. He gave us himself. You want to see what a golden rule of life looks like, Jesus says? Then you look at my life, and he just lived it. And then Jesus said this one day, you want to see what a golden rule of death looks like? Then you look at my cross. And he went there, and he died the death, that gave life to you and to me, and he forgave my sins and yours. And then Jesus says, you want to see what a golden rule of resurrection looks like? And the Lord Jesus comes out of the tomb, and he gives hope to every one of us. He was like the golden rule made into a person. And now he says to us, if you'll let me, I'll help you live that kind of life. To help you be the golden rule deal with every person you encounter. So again, the challenge this week is to live with golden rule eyes. It's as simple. Think about people you will see this week, people you live with, your spouse, your roommates, family, people in your neighborhood, people where you go to work, people where you go to school, people that you're going to run into at a restaurant or a store, a clerk standing behind a counter, people who are older, people who are younger, people who are richer, people who are poor, people who are well-educated, and people who are not. People here in the church. Do a golden rule pause. You guys can do this, so can I. And God will help. Put yourself in that person's shoes. Take your mind off of yourself and pause for a moment and think, now if I was that person, their hopes and their dreams and their life and their fears, how would I want to be treated? And then allow the Holy Spirit that has called you, that fills you, just to give you a little nudge. Now I can have that golden rule moment. So the focus is off you and the focus is off me. It's not about how they treat us. It's about how are we treating them. And by the way, in the moment, the golden rule can look like a sacrifice, uh, even feel a little bit scary, because you're putting somebody else first. But in the end, I tell you this, and God says this, you will end up with more love and more joy and more depth and more meaning and more friendships than you know what to do with. Because this is the law of the inversion in the kingdom of God. Where those who put themselves last end up being first. Where those who make themselves the servant of all become the greatest of all. Where the people who live under the rule of gold end up empty. But the people who live with the golden rule end up full. That's the golden rule. Have a golden rule week. Be a golden rule person. And let's have St. Mark's get the word out to the community. We're a golden rule church. God grant that for Jesus' sake. Amen. And now may the peace of God that goes beyond all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith unto life eternal. Amen. Let's stand and sing.
Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the prayers. Let us pray for the whole people of God, in Christ Jesus, and for all people according to their needs. Gracious God, you work all things for good and for those who love you. Help us to see your guiding hand in our lives, especially in times of trial and struggle. Remind us that it is you who will make a way where there is no way, and you will turn our despair into hope and joy. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father, we thank you for the gift of forgiveness and for your son Jesus, who took our sin on himself even though he was sinless. Grant that our hearts and our minds would be free from worry and that we would readily embrace the grace that you so freely offer. Let us also offer that grace to those who have offended us or hurt us. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Heavenly Father, be with those who live alone or are lonely. May they find comfort in your holy word and in the company of friends and family and neighbors. Grant them peace in their solitude and purpose in their lives. For those who feel they have no purpose, remind them to cling to you and praise your name, focusing on you rather than themselves. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Abide in the Lord. Grant your tender mercy on all who grieve the loss of loved ones or who are battling illness or disease. Be with them in their trouble and comfort them with the hope of your never failing promises for a new life. Father, we remember Judge Cook and Dennis, uh, her son upon the death of her daughter-in-law, Kathy Cook. Thank you again for redeeming Kathy and holy baptism. So be with Dennis and Toots and the entire family. Comfort them with the gospel. Comfort them with the promise of the resurrection in Jesus our Savior. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Father, we also ask that you would continue to be with Alice and Brenda, Reggie and Chris, Mark and Ricky, Scott and Tom, Karen and Kathy, Joyce and Kathy, Janet and Vicki, Joe and Bruce, Ron and Elaine, Beverly and Betty. Watch over them. Bless them with your healing power. And we also remember Adam Lee, who continues to struggle and go through tests. Be with them all according to your good and gracious will. Grant them health and healing and restoration. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. And Heavenly Father, we also remember the Thompson family on the death of uh, their son Jeff at age 38. Bless Jenny and Steve and their family with your Holy Spirit and comfort them with your Holy Spirit, powerful love in Jesus our Savior. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We now bring our offerings to the Lord. Please remember to fill out the attendance pads on the center aisle, and then pass those to the people next to